Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I think uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Marika. Um, and I'm so excited to do this because I've known Marika for, I think, three years um, when I was a youth in one of her <laughs> or in two of her programs um, with the Environmental Youth Alliance. And yeah, I think she really inspired in me a really big passion for uh for pollinators and for for bees in particular and native bees specifically so um yeah i'm like just so incredibly thrilled that um she's going to be doing this talk tonight and i think we're all going to just learn so much um yeah i'll just read her bio for you so that you can you know in case you <laughs> are not sure uh yeah you didn't read the description of the event um so Marika is a first generation settler with Chinese Singaporean ancestry on her mother's side and Dutch ancestry on her father's side. She grew up on the traditional territories of the Stolo First Peoples where the mountain rangers of this valley meet to embrace the river. Marika has put down roots uh, in Coast Salish territories with her partner Chris, her female BL, <laughs> feline familiars, Connor and River, and many plant friends. She is a program manager for the Environmental Youth Alliance running pollinator stewardship and indigenous land guardianship programs alongside a small scale native plant nursery. Uh, she has a BSci in applied biology from the University of British Columbia with a focus on native bees and floral ecology. She's a big bug nerd and recently co-founded and is vice president of the Native Bee Society of BC. And she's also spent many years volunteering with the BD Biodiversity Museum and is well connected with Vancouver's nonprofit and environmental stewardship community. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass it off to Marika. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Emma. Uh, I'm just going to figure out how to share my screen here. Mm -hmm. Okay, can we see that? Emma, can you give me a thumbs up? Hope we can see it. Great. Okay, well, thank you everyone so much for having me today. Um, I always am filled with so much joy when I get to talk about pollinators and bees, so really glad to be spending this evening with you. Um, before I get started, I'd love to share a little bit about my organization that I work for, the Environmental Youth Alliance. Um, EYA, First of all, our mission is to connect youth facing barriers with nature, community, and skills to benefit their lives and steward the environment. And basically, EYA, we have three different categories of programs. We have um, our Nature Stewards programs, which I manage, um, and these are programs that are really intertwined with our native plant nursery. Uh, they're focused on land indigenous land guardianship, pollinator community science, um, as well as we have a plants and people program under that category. And second, we have our elementary school workshops, which are called wild mind workshops. And third, we have this just starting this year, we have this really amazing um, new youth internship program where we pay youth to come and uh, learn different stewardship based skills and skills connecting to the land and we, we train them in first aid and um, and food safe and different practical skills and then we connect them to different uh, environmental organizations in the city that um, are looking for interns. So yeah, lots of different work with youth. Um, we work with youth of all many different backgrounds and yeah, it's very Soul, soul filling, really lovely work that we do. And um, EYA's home base is Strathcona Community Garden, which is um, on the edge of Chinatown in the downtown east side. So it's a really beautiful and fascinating place to be working. Um, at the end, let me just see here if I, I can't really post to the chat because I have my screen open, but I just wanted to share that if you'd like to support EYA, um, you can visit our website. Um, oh, actually, I can figure out the chat here. Here we go. Um, so, yeah, if you'd like to support EYA, you could join our newsletter, and then you can do that by uh, clicking the link that I just posted to the chat there. Okay. So here's a little overview of our workshop. Um, the first, I'd say, 
two thirds of our workshop is going to be focused on, first of all, how to identify bees. Um, there are many different types of insects that you find in the garden and near flowers that look like bees, but in fact are what we call wannabes. So they are, they look closely, closely to bees, but are a lot, actually a little bit different in certain ways, as we'll come to find out. Uh, second, we're going to do a deep dive into um, what the different groups of bees that we see in the city and kind of how we can loosely identify them based on those different groupings. And finally, we're going to wrap up with um, some details on how you can support pollinators, not only bees, but all kinds of pollinators by creating habitat in, uh, the gar in gardens and cities and whatever different places that you work with. Okay, so first off, we are gonna dive into a game. And for those of you who have done a presentation with me before, you probably are familiar with this game. Um, it's called Be or Not a Bee. And basically what I'm gonna be doing is sharing different photos of bees and their common lookalikes. And your job is to figure out whether it's a bee or not a bee. Um, Emma's gonna be posting a poll that will allow you to vote. And then after we, we get answers from different people, I'll reveal the answer and have a little discussion about it. So here is our first photo. And Emma, are you able to put up the poll? Uh, yeah, so, I just launched it. Is it coming through? Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, I see. So we see this photo here and take a guess whether you think it's a bee or not a bee. Yeah, we've got 70% voted, 77. Oh, I see Peter over there. Hi, Peter. <laughs> okay, so it looks like most of us have voted and many of us were successful with this answer. Way to go, not a B. And as many of you probably know, this is um, not a bee, but in fact a wasp or a common yellow jacket. Um, so yeah, hopefully those of you who come to this, have come to this uh, webinar already know that and you can always be that person that, um, you know, when a wasp is chasing someone around their picnic, you can be like, hey, that's not, that's not a bee, that's a wasp. The good, like, very um, introductory fact of the world of bees. Okay, this one. This is an in. First of all, I should. Okay, one thing I need to back up on and say is that these photos are not, as you may, as you may be able to tell, they're not live bees. They are photos from the Spencer Entomological Collection, so they're on pins. And this one is not the very best photographed insect. One thing I should tell you is its head is facing down like this. So we're actually looking at the back of its head um, and its wings are, that's why its wings are a little crumpled. That's not what it's like in real life. Um, so yeah, what do we think, B or not a B? This one, we have a little bit more of a split here. We have 40% of us think it's a B, 60% think it's not. Well, the answer is this is not a B. Uh, so this is actually a type of parasitic wasp. So that, for those of you who don't know, parasitic wasps are um, a group of wasps that actually, the females actually lay their eggs inside the bodies of other insects and their babies will then hatch out and feed on that insect as their primary food source. Um, so this one, bee or not a bee. Can we, or we just got to refresh the poll. Here we go. B or not a B. Great, okay. So it looks like most of us have answered. I'm going to reveal that this is in fact a bee and I'm really proud of y'all for getting this one mostly right. Um, and so next let's jump into this because 
first of all, those two insects that we looked at um, are somewhat similar in that they're both green and metallic, as we can see. Um, but let's, let's dive a little deeper into what makes them different. So actually, first I'm going to jump to this photo. Um, so looking at them side by side, I'm sure that some of you can start to see a few differences. Um, first of all, the one really noticeable difference between these two insects is that one is very hairy and one is not. And of course, the bee has a lot more hairs covering its body. And that really has to do with the life history of this bee, what it does on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's jump back to this table here. So on the left-hand side, yeah, we see the properties, the different characteristics of bees and on the right of wasps. Um, one thing I want to start this whole conversation out with, first of all, is that in a scientific sense, bees actually are wasps. Um, they are a group of wasps that millions of years ago went vegetarian. Um, so that, that difference in their behavior has a lot to do with how the differences between how bees and wasps look. Um, and yeah, so we can think of wasps kind of as a larger grouping of insects that bees are a subcategory within. Um, but the one difference that sets bees apart from other wasps is that rather than eating insects for their food or providing insects for their babies to eat food, they provide pollen and nectar. Um, so other differences between bees or wasps, first of all, bees tend to be a little more curvaceous. Um, wasps can have very, tend to have very narrow waists and sometimes an even elongated narrow waist. Um, as we saw in the photos, bees are often very hairy. Wasps have hairs, but usually not as many. And if you were to look at those hairs under a microscope, you would see that bees, they have branched hairs. So kind of, um, yeah, they come off into many different branches, whereas wasps just have singular hairs. Uh, another difference is that if you ever see a, a, a wasp carrying pollen on its body, you know that that is actually a bee. Um, and specifically a female bee, because it's only the females that carry the pollen. Um, second, and, fi and finally, in terms of telling them apart, um, wasps tend to have long skinny legs with, um, with little spikes on them. And that also has to do with the fact that they're carnivores and um, they need those kind of claws on their legs to catch on to their prey. Um, another thing I wanted to tie in here that really helps when you're observing these um, different insects in a garden or in nature is just noticing how they move more broadly. Um, first of all, bees will often see them moving between different flowers, especially female bees. Um, males can be doing the same. Um, their males are often more looking for, or they will be looking more for nectar when visiting flowers, but also we see male bees kind of traversing and looking for females to mate with. Um, and the difference with wasps is that often they are, they're not going to be, they're mostly, when we see wasps flying, they're often traversing habitat looking for their prey. Um, that being said, many wasps also um, do visit flowers, but specifically to drink nectar. Um, so you'll never see a wasp, well actually I don't want to say never because there's always exceptions in the, in the natural world, but um, mo more often than not, not, wasps will be collecting, will just be sucking up nectar when they visit flowers. And finally, some, there's some l smaller wasps or wasps of all different kinds that have, um, they, you'll see wasps sometimes twitching their antenna, which is something that bees don't do. Um, so yeah, one other way to tell them apart there. Okay. And yeah, we can just have another quick look-see at this, at this slide, comparing the differences. We see the spiny legs on the wasp. We see the hairy legs on the bee. Um, 
And one other thing is they both have um, two pairs of wings, since they're, that's a common characteristic of um, insects in the wasp, in the order that wasps are in. Okay, on to the next uh, bee or not a bee. Let's set up the poll for this one, Emma. So, be or not be is the question. And one other thing I should note is that little golden orb in the middle is not a part of the bee. That's actually a pin that is stuck through this specimen. So, there's no gold on this bee, unfortunately. Though there are gold bees in the world. Okay, it looks like, oh, we still have a few more votes coming in. Wow, okay, so it looks, oh, someone changed their answer there. The answer is, this is in fact a bee. Um, so many of you got this right by now. We can see this is a very, very fuzzy insect. It has two pairs of wings, long antenna, um, and it has fuzz all over its body. And this bee is actually called the blue orchard mason bee. And some of you out in the audience may uh, keep these bees in your backyards and in, um, in either nesting tunnels or little cavity nesting bee houses. EYA actually also is starting to, um, we have a, an insect hotel at Strathcona where, um, that we've installed to help raise these bees so we can um, give them out to the community. Okay, so next up, bee or not a bee? Set up that poll. It's not, it stopped working. <laughs> um, okay, I think it's, it still says it hasn't ended. Okay, there. I, oh, can you, you can do yeah, it. Let's see. Okay. Um, <laughs> continue. There we go. Okay, bee or not a bee? Mm, interesting, we're very split on this one. Hmm. We're almost at a 50-50, interesting. It is a tricky one. So it looks like 80% of us voted, so I'm going to end the poll there and reveal the answer, which is not a B. Um, so yeah, many of you might have been surprised like this because uh, this, this insect is a very successful bee mimic. Um, let's move on to another question and we'll kind of puzzle this one out later. So. Here's our next one, um, B or not a B. I'm gonna launch the poll here. We're also split on this one by the looks of it. Let's get those votes in. We still have a quarter of us that haven't submitted yet. Puzzling it out. Hmm. Okay, I'm gonna give you three more seconds to submit your answer and then I'm gonna close the poll. Two, one. Great, okay, and the answer is this is also not a bee. Whoa, what's up with that? So um, the two insects that we saw on our previous slides were actually flies that are um, very common bee mimics. So here we can see um, a comparison between two and um, some photos on the side. So first of all, um, 
first of all, flies and bees are in com um, completely different orders of insects. So they have a lot more differences between them than bees and wasps do. Um, that being said, there are many flies that have over, million, over many, many millions of years um, evolved to look a lot like bees. So as you can see in the two photos here, you can see that flies have a lot shorter antennas than bees. They're kind of, if anything, they're little tiny um, like nubs. Um, and whereas bees, they have long antennas that stick way up beyond their body. Um, also, flies only have one pair of wings, whereas bees have two pairs of wings. Um, flies actually also have, um, almost like we have a tailbone, flies actually have these two little nubs on their body called halteres that are our remnant wings, um, but they've devolved the need for two pairs of wings, so they just have one. Also, of course, bees are the ones that have pollen collecting hairs on their legs or their bodies, whereas flies don't have pollen collecting hairs on their bodies. And finally, um, if you ever have seen a fly, even a house fly, um, you'll notice that their eyeballs usually take up most of their head. They're really, really big. Um, and most bees have eyes that are more on the side of their head. That being said, there is a small group of bees, or some, some bees, particularly male bees, can have more fly-like eyeballs as well. But if you're unsure, just take a look at those antennae and that will, um, will tell you for sure. So I'm just gonna scroll back to these, this other photo here just for y'all to take a closer look. And now with those different characteristics that we saw, we can see um, looking at the head in particular, that in this insect looks a lot more like a fly head. It's got those tiny antenna um, and also just one pair of wings. But um, the abdomen of this fly has evolved to look quite a bit like maybe a honeybee, I would say, um, which is really fascinating. And here is another really excellent bee mimic. Um, as you can see, it's got the big eyeballs um, and only one pair of wings, but this species, Volucella bombulans, has evolved to look very similar to a bumblebee. And for me, there's been many times in the field uh, where I wasn't looking carefully and I caught one of these thinking it was a bumblebee, but just, um, yeah, just to be revealed that in fact, it was a fly that had tricked me. Um, and here's a side-by-side -side of a bumblebee and, uh, and that bee mimicking fly, just so you can draw the comparison there. Um, take a look at the antennas. You can see the bee has two pairs of wings. Um, and yeah, of course, the difference in the eyeballs is very significant. Okay, so this one is a tricky one, I would say. Um, that's my only clue, that it's tricky. So where, oh yeah, can we set up the poll again, Emma? I think I exited out of it accidentally. I still can't bring it up for some reason. I'm not sure oh, no. Let me see if I can, oh, here we go. Okay. I found it. <laughs> Sorry about that. No worries. Okay, so B or not a B, everybody. What do we think? Okay, we'll wrap it up in a few more seconds. And we are going to close. So um, most of us thought this wasn't a bee. And the answer is this is actually a bee. What? So I honestly, I think I misled a few of us here um, just by saying that bee, in general, bees are hairy, which is true. 
Um, but I wanted to throw this one in here, this species or this genus of bees, because it's, as I said before, nature never likes to follow the, the categories that we want to put it in. Um, and here is an example of a bee in the genus Hylaeus, um, which are some, sometimes called cellophane bees, or, or in this particular genus is called masked bees commonly because they have yellow markings on their face. Um, but this particular group of bees, they actually um, will collect their pollen and nectar and um, they ingest it. And then actually when they bring it back to their nest to feed the babies, they regurgitate it. So these bees store their pollen internally, which is why they don't need as many hairs on their bodies to collect the pollen. Um, yeah. So that is, yeah, our exception to the rule, the special bee. Okay, so now that was the last of our game and we're gonna dive into our next section, talking about the different kinds of bees that we can find in Vancouver. And first of all, I'd like to share that, um, before going into this, that bees are a very diverse group of insects. And it's actually really difficult to identify most bees to species out in the field. Um, and, but so often to identify bees, we have entomologists or melatologists who study bees, they have to collect them and actually look at them under a microscope. Um, so for that reason, and for the purposes of today, uh, the way that I'm organizing these next few slides focused on identification is by grouping bees into um, different uh, morphological groups that will help when you're just walking out and about in the garden and you don't plan on collecting insects to learn them. So our first group that we're going to focus on is bumblebees. Um, so bumblebees are, um, of course, our fuzzy bees that we often see out in the garden. There are a few other types of bees that are fuzzy, like bumblebees, but not quite as, um, I don't know, as, as cute and as, as, as fluffy looking as bumblebees are. Um, so when we look at a, a bee and are wondering what it is to tell it's a bumblebee, um, you are looking for a fuzzy body overall. And also uh, looking at its hind leg, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but um, on the tibia of the bee, which is, if we're looking at this bee on the flower, it's just below what kind of looks like its back knee joint. Um, that's where it would hold the pollen if it was a female. Um, this bee in particular is in, in the purple with the purple flower is actually a male, so it doesn't have any pollen on its body. Um, but yeah, it's just below the knee joint there. And one thing just to point out about bumblebees in particular that's, that's different, and also this is a characteristic of honeybees, which are in the same family as bumblebees, um, is bumblebees carry their pollen wet. So often when you see it attached to their leg, it will look kind of um, shiny or moist. And that means they've mixed it together with nectar and attaching it to their corbicula on, on their legs. And corbicula is just the word for those pollen collecting hairs. Um, so bum there are around 32 species of bumblebees in British Columbia. And they're the only truly social native bees to British Columbia. So many of us um, here may be familiar with honeybees. Um, and you may have noticed I haven't really talked much about honeybees in this presentation. And the reason being is that um, honeybees are actually not native to British Columbia. Uh, they were brought over here uh, in the 1700s. Um, originally from Europe, actually. And it's really interesting because a lot of what we learn in school about bees is focused on the ecology and the dynamics and the, the hive behaviors of honeybees. But in reality, honeybees are kind of the, 
the odd ones out um, there, especially in relation to the bees that are native to British Columbia. Um, so yeah, as we move through these next slide, I encourage you to try and let go of any of those preconceived notions that you have about bees, because you may, yeah, pick up a new thing or two if, that, if those are the bees that you are most familiar with before. Um, so yeah, bumblebees, as I mentioned, are the only truly social native bees to BC. Um, they, their colonies, though, are much smaller than honeybee colonies. Whereas honeybee colonies number in the tens of thousands, bumblebee colonies are more in the hundreds. Um, so 300 bees would be um, a large colony of bumblebees. Um, another thing that we may have heard of is bumblebees use buzz pollination. So there's certain flowers that will only release their pollen if they're activated by this high frequency buzz. And the bumblebees have these muscles in their wings that they can vibrate really rapidly that releases that pollen. And in the agriculture industry, um, there are certain crops that are um, reliant on bumblebee pollination. And some examples are um, plants in the nightshade family, such as um, tomatoes or eggplants. Um, and yeah, so that's another special thing about bumblebees. And finally, um, bumblebees, another thing that sets bumblebees apart uh, from honeybees, even though they're also social, bumblebees just have a one year, about a one year life cycle. Um, sometimes they can, multiple colonies can be established within a year, but the typical, um, the general um, life cycle of a bumblebee is usually around a year. And, um, I won't go too much into what that life cycle is like, but um, essentially it's just what come around this time of year actually is when our colonies, when the queen bumblebees are starting to lay new queens for the next year and also males. Um, and after mating with males from other colonies, the queens will, the males actually will die off and the queens will over winter so they'll find a, a little place usually underground sometimes in like piles of in, in a really shallow um, um, hole underground or just under some leaf litter the queens will rest there over the winter and then in around february or march is when they will emerge and start to establish their own colony um, another thing that is different about bumblebees and honeybees is that in the big that uh, those early months, uh, the queen will actually forage for food. So she will be going out and collecting pollen and nectar to provide food for the first generation of, um, of eggs that she lays. And the last thing before I, I switch to our next group of bees is I wanted to do a plug for this awesome app called Bumblebee Watch. It's a great, I love Bumblebee Watch because it's a, a wonderful citizen science app for learning how to identify bumblebees to species. Um, bumblebees are one of the only groups that we can identify to species quite easily in the field. And this app has an amazing guide that you can walk through uh, to help you identify them by the color bands on the back of their abdomen. Okay, so next up. We have hairy belly bees. Um, so hairy belly bees are a family of bees. Um, just to back up, bumblebees were a genus of bees. So that's a more, um, a smaller grouping, whereas as hairy belly bees are a family. And the family that they're from is called Megachelidae. And that name comes from um, the Latin word for large lips. And as you can see down in the photo below, uh, we have a picture of an, um, a leaf cutter bee here and it's mandibles. And you can see how huge those are. Um, and yeah, that's one thing that sets these bees apart um, in terms of their anatomy from other bees. And second, these bees all carry dry pollen on their bodies and specifically on the bottoms of their, the underside of their abdomen. So in the top right photo of this slide, you can see a photo of a leaf cutter bee 
and these dense collections of scopa or pollen collecting hairs on the bottom of its abdomen. Um, so yeah, if you ever see a bee flying with a bright orange or yellow or even some sunflowers have blue pollen on the bottom of their abdomen, it's often a hairy belly bee. And so these bees are all um, solitary, so meaning that we have one female and one um, that mates with a male and just the female provisions for all of her, her young. Uh, typically this group mostly nests in cavities, um, empty cavities, so uh, different places that we might find like yeah, the little holes in nature. Um, they don't actually dig their own, this group of bees, um, or they also nest in the ground. And what really is, I think, really fascinating about this family of bees is the diversity of different um, substrates or natural materials that they use to um, protect and um, create their nests out of. So in the top right photo uh, on this slide, we have leaf cutter bees. And as you may guess, these bees, they actually go out and they'll chomp off a little um, circle of a leaf and they carry that back to their nest and they actually wallpaper their nests with these leaves. Um, the next one below that leaf cutter bee is called a mason bee. And that name comes from um, the fact that these bees, they actually build walls out of mud. So they don't wallpaper their nests with mud like leaf cutter bees do, but they will, um, yeah, just build different walls in the different partitions in their nests are separated by mud. Um, and they also use their mandibles to, to dig that up and also carry it back to their nests. And the bottom right photo in this slide is called, um, a wool carter bee, and this specific one is called Amphidium manicata. And it is the only type of wool carter bee that we'll find in the city, um, but it is um, really common and widespread. And what makes, what, what wool carter bees use is what, what you might guess, um, they collect wool of some sort to partition their nests with. And um, that wool or the little tiny hairs that they gather are the trichomes on top of, on the surfaces of, of different leaves. So different leaves have um, layers of hairs and these bees will scrape those up and use those to partition their nests. Okay. So next grouping of bees that we have is a really big group, um, but I'm calling these pollen pants bees. And the reason that we call them pollen pants bees is of course all these bees, they carry pollen on their legs. And note that um, this pollen is carried dry, so it will look more dusty uh, when carried on their legs. And first of all, this is I almost feel bad looping these all into one group because it's so big and diverse. As we can see, there's four different families of bees in this group. Um, and I would say if you're interested in learning bee identification at a deeper level than this, um, you would want to take a, a course on bees. Um, but this is a great, I think this is a good grouping for us beginners here because um, yeah, it's easy to tell apart in the field. And you can see this photo here right in the middle. Uh, this is an Andrina. Um, and you can see that dry, dusty pollen that's carried up and down its legs. Now in this group, we have bees that have like just little pockets of pollen. Some of them have like short shorts. Some of them have capri pants. And some of them have the full pants um, that carry pollen. So there's a lot of diversity even just in how they carry the pollen on their legs. Um, these are often the bees also that people don't notice as much, I would say. Like when I point them out, people are like, wow, I would never thought of that was a bee before. Um, so yeah, just look around for those little flying insects visiting flowers with pollen up and down their legs. Um, in this group, we have mostly solitary bees, but some are semi-social. So um, meaning that they will nest 
even though there's still individual females providing for their nest, they um, will nest in aggregations or groupings. And a great place to find um, uh, ground nesting bees is actually in, in the city at least, um, actually even in small in more rural areas, if you have lawns in your community that are kind of really old and they have lots of weeds and patchy areas, check out those patchy areas and you can often see um, different bees trying to nest in the ground there. Sorry, my cat is in the room and trying to escape. Um, so yeah, look for in, in areas of lawns and get low, really low to the ground and you'll often see these bees um, and nesting in patchy lawns. Um, sorry, I'm just gonna quickly open the door here. My cat, very funny. Okay, um, and then one other bee, it's the, the middle one out of these three in the photos, um, is Saratina. So this is, or Saratina, uh, there's two different ways of pronouncing, but these bees will actually nest in the pith of flat, the pith meaning the center of, if this is a stem, it's like the center of the stem. It's a more softer part of a plant stem. They will actually hollow that out and nest in uh, the center of those stems. And ser seratina are a group of bees that are related to honeybees and bumblebees actually, but they look quite different. And this photo doesn't do it justice. Ser seratina are really small, small bees. Um, also on the top right, lots of people often, and even in the photo in the middle here, lots of people don't realize that we have metallic green bees. And these are really common bees in Vancouver. I've seen them um, around a lot right now at this time of year in midsummer. And they're from the genus Agapostamin. Um, and they often, you'll often see them visiting um, more uh, families related to daisies or in the aster family. Um, because they have short tongues, so they can't really dig deep into the flowers that have deep nectar sources. So this is in the, the photo on the left here, it's an um, egg opossumin visiting a calendula flower. But I've also seen them on yeah, lots of different kinds of daisies and dandelions and things. Um, yeah, okay, so let's move on. So this is the last kind of grouping of all the other neat bees. Um, one bee that I felt kind of was, yeah, not included in these other morphological groupings was the masked bee or Hylaeus, and that's the top right photo, the bee that stumped many of us. Um, so these bees are, they're actually related to, um, there are some bees in this family Calidae that are also pollen pants bees, but this specific genus, Hylaeus, um, they are quite different than their their gener their genera cousins, um, Calides. So, Hylaeus have um, are also called masked bees because they often have yellow markings on their face. Again, that's something that you may need to look at them under a microscope to see, or just have a really quick eye. Um, this photo on at the top here shows a photo of um, a Hylaeus face like that. Uh, Hylaeus also, they nest in small cavities and hollow stems. So almost similar to um, our hairy belly bees in that way. And also um, this group is, is special as we talked about because they, they actually consume the pollen and nectar and regurgitate it into their nests. So these bees almost look very wasp-like because they don't have as much hair on their body. Um, another bee, group of bees that looks quite wasp-like are the cuckoo bees. Um, and we can also call these parasitic bees. So there are many different genera um, of cuckoo bees. And this um, habit has actually evolved, um, we believe it's evolved independently many times. And uh, this group of bees are, they actually parasitize other bees. And often these are um, species that are closely related, but then there are exceptions to the rule. Like this red bee on the right here is called a nomada bee. Um, and it's a whole different family of bees that they all are um, nest parasites. 
Um, but there are, this one on the bottom right here is called Coleoxys. And this is a bee that is in the fam same family as hairy belly bees um, and also parasitizes those bees. So these bees, how they parasitize them is they will enter um, the nest of a female bee and they will often um, either kill the brood or they will lay their eggs beside and um, the, the babies will also, will, will yeah, the, the female bee, I believe she kills the, the brood of the other bees um, and the babies of her, her offspring will hatch out and, the mud, and they will eat the resources that um, the resident mother bee had provided for her offspring. So they're almost like um, they're almost like forcing their babies into like bee foster care and like outsourcing the parenting um, the parenting act to uh, to another species of bee or a different mother bee. And yeah, these bees often have a specialist relationship with a genus or a family of bees, um, though there are some that are more that generalize a little more. Um, and you can also use these, when you find parasitic bees, they can often be indicative of like a healthy bee habitat. Because um, of course there needs to be a well-established population of bees to support um, the reproduction of these cuckoo bees. Um, also, one, one special bee in this group, the um, Citherus, is a group of bumblebees, or the parasitic bumblebees. Um, in that sense, you actually have a queen bumblebee coming in and invading a colony and killing the other queen bee and then almost enslaving the workers of that queen to then um, take care of her young as she lays them. So that's pretty interesting. Okay, so for our last little segment here, um, we are gonna chat a little bit about providing habitat for pollinators. And I've gathered some of my main principles that I love to recommend uh, for planting uh, habitats that support pollinators. First of all, oh hey Chelsea and Cole, I just saw you turn your video. Um, first of all, we want to plant native plants. And the reason for this is that there's many bees out there that um, have very special rela specialist relationships with native plants. Um, so if that native plant is not planted in an area, of course that bee can't, um, can't survive in that habitat. So that's why we want to plant native plants um, that are adapted to the region that we're living in. Uh, second, we want to provide plant diversity, and that's diversity in terms of the colors as well as the shapes and the sizes of the flowers that we plant. Um, there are different bees have different types of bodies that are adapted to specific kinds of flowers. Um, some bees have long tongues, some bees have short tongues. So for that reason, we need to plant um, a diversity of flowers. And also colors, of course. Um, different colors of flowers attract different types of pollinators. And I should be speaking more broadly too because um, different types of pollinators also have different lengths of tongues. For example, butterflies have really long proboscises that will reach deep into a flower to collect nectar. Same with hummingbirds, they have long beaks that can um, reach into the depths of flowers. And um, wasps and flies, which are also pollinators, tend to have shorter tongues, so they need shallower flowers. Um, so second, we want to plant in large clumps or drifts. And the reason being is that this makes it a lot easier, first of all, to attract um, pollinators to your area. And second of all, it's, it helps pollinators in um, reducing the amount of energy that they have to expend moving from flower to flower. And third, this is what we often see in nature is, is these flowers growing in large clumps. And next, um, we want to be planting flowers with overlapping bloom times. So um, we want to have a, yeah, a very continual succession of different flowers blooming in your garden. 
So that way there's no periods where the pollinators go without resources. If you have a gap in bloom times, it probably means that you're leaving out supporting a certain group of pollinators. So that's why we want to have overlap. Um, and also jumping down, we want to have, um, it's good to have at least three species blooming at a given time. That's just a general rule I like to recommend to support um, more diversity and support as diverse pollinators as possible. And finally, we want to prioritize, there's certain times of the year where um, flowers are more scarce. Like for example, I live right beside, um, close to Jericho Beach Park. And I noticed um, just in, live, in spending a lot of time in the park this year that there's tons of, of spring blooming plants, but at this time of year, um, the floor resources have really declined. So um, we really want to focus on these early spring blooming flowers. So flowers that bloom in February, March, that's when we tend to have less flowers. And also this time of year, um, August, September, October. Um, there are many late summer bees that will rely on these resources and be excluded from your, your habitats if we don't uh, provide for them. And this is so many, so much different information. How the heck do we organize that? Um, I want to put forward this idea, which is constructing a bloom calendar. So this is one that I put together to develop a wildflower mix for um, three, EYA planted three different wildflower meadows across East Vancouver. And it helped me to um, monitor and, and just map out the different sizes and colors and also bloom times of these flowers. So it, um, yeah, so here's a great example of how you can do that. And as you can see too, even with my, this map, or the, the, this set of flowers here, I struggled to find flowers that were early spring resources, um, except for yarrow, which is blooms for a really long time. But um, if I were to create this again, I'd try, really try and source some more early spring blooming flowers. Okay. Oh, so let's see if this works. I have a little video to share here. This is a little bee, um, just actually in the backyard outside of my house. Uh, there she is nesting in the ground. So this is uh, an Andrina mining bee. And as you can see, um, like I said, this is in the patchy lawn somewhere and she's digging down to her nest underground there. And this video was just to illustrate the importance of um, leaving habitat for nesting in habitats that we're creating for pollinators. Um, so mining bees, we really want to leave their patches of undisturbed soil or lawn. Um, and that will, it's, it's hard to say whether the bees will move in or not, but they really do like, honestly, like compacted soil. So not like, yeah, it's got to be like, um, really compacted and kind of sandy in texture. Um, and yeah, so that's an example of a natural um, nesting habitat for ground nesting bees. Just to jump over, there's, I don't really know of any human made um, versions of nesting habitat for mining bees. But for bumblebees here, we see that um, in our gardens and, and habitats, we want to leave piles of leaf litter. Bumblebees also will look for empty rodent burrows. Um, and they'll even nest, I've seen them nesting um, underneath building foundations and in, in tree cavities. Um, though tr buildings aren't really natural, but <laughs> they're not really made for bees, is what I'm getting at here. Um, so in terms of human made, you can make nest boxes for bumblebees as well. Sometimes I've also even heard people putting out teapots. Um, one thing about bumblebee nests is that they can have relatively, they're not always very successful at attracting bumblebees into the nest, but different ways that I've heard of people trying to attract bumblebees are, um, one way is actually spreading like the urine of like mice or like closely related animals. Like I've heard of someone using like hamster urine from their kids like hamster um, cage in a bumblebee nest box to try and encourage. I don't know if it was successful or not, but that's a good way that you could try to attract some more bumblebees. 
So for cavity nesting bees, um, these are the hairy belly bees. And in nature, they tend to nest in hollow stems um, under the bark of fallen logs, also in woodpecker and beetle holes, and also in the ground. Um, and these bees are, are very, uh, we, there's been lots of different innovation in terms of providing man-made habitats for them. Um, you can, I've seen, you can use bamboo, um, you can use rolled paper tubes, you can take a block of wood and drill different holes into them for these bees to nest in. Um, but one thing I would encourage, and yeah, if anyone has questions about um, managing bee houses, they can ask in the, in the question period, but um, one thing I would highly encourage is if you're putting out these homes for even bumblebees, but particularly cavity nesting bees, please make sure to clean them out year after year. Um, in the city especially, we have lots of different parasites and pests that will um, move into these bee houses. And since we're, we're putting these nesting areas in such congregated spaces, spaces they can be um, places like hot spots for prom actually promoting um, and encouraging different pest populations. So that's why it's really important to clean out, to just really understand the care that goes into putting out bee houses and making sure that you are cleaning it every year. And I'd be happy to provide resources on that if, um, if you're interested. So, so as I leave you, um, just a few points I'd like to leave you with. Uh, when next time you're out in the garden and you see flowers around you, take a closer look at what's buzzing around and see if you can figure out what it is. Um, also, we want to, I just want to highlight that there's over 450 species of bees in British Columbia and they're all very unique and diverse. Um, one thing I forgot to say that I love to say is bees come in all colors of the rainbow. So remember that um, when you're, yeah, when you're out in the garden. Maybe you'll see a red bee or a green bee or a, a purple bee. Um, also, of course, we want to be planting diverse native plant habitat gardens so, to support our wild pollinators. And finally, um, if you're keeping a bee house, please make sure to regularly clean it uh, to reduce transmission between our wild, and um, we want to prevent negatively impacting our wild bee populations. So I think, yeah, that is it for me. Oh, let me just double check that I didn't miss any slides. Yep, that's it. Hey, thank you so much, Marika. <laughs> that was amazing. Um, so if people have questions, if I mean, I think it's fine if you just want to unmute and ask them if or if you feel more comfortable to just put them in the chat, uh, do that. Um, I think we'll, yeah, we'll try and wrap up around 830. If that sounds good to you, Marika. Um, so however many questions we can get through. I didn't see in, any in the chat so far, I don't think. But uh, yeah, feel free to unmute or pop it in the chat, whatever makes sense. Um, I, I had a question come privately, but I'm just going to answer it publicly because um, I don't mind sharing this. So the question is, how did you get into bee care and knowledge? Um, and for me, that was a very, yeah, it was an evolutionary process, I would say. Um, it started just by learning. And I think, like, actually, if you met me, um, maybe like a decade ago, I was one of those people that was really scared of insects in general. Um, and like anytime I'd see something flying or a bee, I'd be like, oh, get it away from me um, and be really freaked out by it. But yeah, I had just a few different people in my life um, show, start to show me the wonders of the insect world. And um, one of my friends uh, used to call them like tiny aliens and I'd really I think it's so funny because so many um, so many um, in sci-fi movies they're often based off of like real life things that happen in the insect world and that's what I think yeah I, why I'm just so fascinated by biodiversity in general is just the diversity and um, fascinating like different ways that different 
creatures in the world live. And I think I specifically like insects because they're often um, misunderstood and people are often like, they're not your charismatic, charismatic megafauna, you know, people are, are often more surprised when they find out how cool they are. Um, and caring for bees, I would say <laughs> that evolved, like, um, I actually was a volunteer with EYA myself. I took the beekeeping program when we had that back in the day. Um, and since working for EYA, I've learned a lot for how to care for mason bees and provide habitat for pollinators, both out of interest and just work on the job. Mm -hmm. cool. And yeah, yeah. Um, there is a question about wasps, if that's all right. Yeah, this is from Pavel, uh, one of my, my friends. Um, I assume that's, my, that's the Pavel I know. Um, so he's wondering, my brother has a huge wasp nest outside his house that's growing. Is that dangerous? Um, that's a good question. I would say it depends where the wasp nest is growing. Um, if the wasp nest is in a place that doesn't bother you, I would say just leave it. Um, typically with those social paper wasps, their uh, colonies, will they just have a year annual life cycle as well. So it should die off in the winter and you should be able to remove uh, that um, nest very soon. And yeah, but if it's close to uh, maybe an entrance of your home, if they're getting into your house and they're a problem, then yeah, you could hire an exterminator or um, I'm, I haven't really heard of people relocating wasps nests, but um, yeah, I would say that really depends on the situation. Um, oh, and then actually a, a sub question to this, do they provide any good like bees do? Oh yeah, so lots of people I talk to um, are like, yay bees, boo wasps, or are they think wasps are jerks or something. Um, but I am a huge fan of wasps and I think all of us should be because wasps, they, um, their role that they play in the, the environment is more with stabilizing populations and um, in terms of human benefit, uh, they, are, they are important uh, at, in terms of uh, controlling pests. And also there are certain wasps too that are, are specialist pollinators. Like for example, figs are, the fig trees are completely dependent on wasp pollination. So um, yeah, wasps are predators. They are good at controlling pests and they're also pollinators. And sh should I just keep reading these down here, Emma? Sure, or whatever works better for you. Um, okay. Um, the next one I see here is why do flies mimic bees? Um, so that's a good question. Um, first of all, yeah, I wish I could do this in more of an interactive way, but um, cause I usually like would answer this question with a series of questions. Um, but many of us, as many of us know, bees uh, had the ability, female bees in particular actually, had the ability to sting. And that is known both by humans, but also predators. Um, so flies un don't, haven't evolved that ability to sting. So by mimicking bees, it's, almost, it's a form of protection. Um, they're disguised as bees and predators think, see like, oh, yellow stripes, yellow and black. Um, and they will avoid the flies. And that, so that's a form of protection for them. And another thing I like to highlight with this is that it's not just that one day a fly woke up and put a bee suit on. This is a process that's happened over, over um, many, uh, yeah, millions of years in that uh, the flies that didn't look like bees were eaten, that were visiting flowers were eaten by predators, whereas the ones that looked more like bees were left behind. So that's how we end up with flies that look like bees. Okay. Do you want to read the next question, Emma? Uh, why are there so many bee colonies collapsing? We are at a community garden and all the beehives have died away. Oh, that can be really different depending on, um, 
so you say beehives so i'm 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 wondering with this question if it's related to honeybees or wild bees um but in both cases it would be different um with honeybees there can be a variety of different things leading to their collapse um one number one i would say is varroa mite if it goes unmanaged uh that can really lead to um, a colony collapsing also at this time of year if a um if a colony is uh not very strong there, there can there's a lot of wasp predation that goes on at this time of year uh, that's usually not the cause of the collapse of the bee colony but it's actually more of an outcome of not having a strong colony um, yeah there's many more um, yeah there's so many more different reasons there's different pests and things that can affect honeybee colonies different um, different fungus fungi um, and yeah, so it, they are, yeah, there are many different things. And in terms of mason bees or cavity nesting bees, again, I would say it's, if you have, um, your communities are collapsing, it's, it's probably due to parasitization by parasitic wasps or, um, or different pests coming in like pollen mites, or there's also the Houdini fly now that will um, feed on the pollen that the bees the female bees provide for their babies. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do all bees die when they use their stinger? Okay, so thank you for the question, Dan. Um, so first of all, one thing I'd like to point out with this is that not all bees have stingers. Um, they're, in a general framing, um, bees, it's just female bees that have stingers because they, um, the stinger actually evolved from the ovipositor of the bee, which was the egg laying structure. So male bees don't have stingers. Um, and the question Dan asked was, do all bees die when they use their stinger? Um, that is a trait that at least for bees found in British Columbia, that is reserved for honeybees. Honeybees um, actually have a barbed stinger so it kind of like sticks out like this. So it will get lodged under, when it gets um, embedded into, um, under the skin, it, it will actually stay behind. And the, if the bee like flies away, uh, part of its, its bot, yeah, part of its body basically comes ripped off and it can't survive anymore. Um, other bees don't have barbed stingers, so they can sting multiple times. And same with wasps as well. Not that they do. I would say of all bees, honeybees are the most likely to sting because they have a hive, a colony to protect. Um, mason bees, for example, that I've worked a lot with are like the gen very gentle bees. They're like as um, aggressive. Yeah, they're like as not very, not harmful or aggressive at all. Um, mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, the next question is, uh, I rear mason and leaf cutters, put small filament nets on them and wash them prior to overwintering them, but I still get parasites. Any more tips to try and reduce the parasites? Yeah, it's so tough. I'm honestly still learning this over time. Um, um, well, definitely, as long, as, so one, oh, so you did mention that you wash them prior to overwintering. Um, one thing that I'm trying this year is um, putting out two successions of, of tunnels because of course the mason bees typically come out first and leaf cutter bees come out later. And the problem that I was facing before is that we'd have, I'd have mason bees and leaf cutter bees nesting beside each other. And then in leaving the tunnels out for the leaf cutter bees to nest in, um, it meant that the mason bees Oh, would be attacked by parasitic wasps. Anyways, so that's one thing you could try is putting out like one grouping of tunnel, uh, you, just your, your cavities for the mason bees first and then taking them in in June or at the end, like mid to late June, and then putting another succession out for leaf cutter bees. Um, that would be my, yeah, a new, that's a new trick that I'm trying this year. But other than that, it sounds like you're doing a lot. Um, 
many different things to help. One other thing I would say, if you don't know about them, um, Mo and Shad, is this, there's this new parasitic fly that was introduced, I'd say, three years ago. And you can tell it's entered your, um, your, ca your bee cavities. If you see like this, it's, it looks almost like swirly spaghetti. Um, and that's the, the frass or the poop of the, the larvae of that fly. And that fly is really difficult to control. The only way at this time that I've found you can control it is by just squishing the adults. So take a look, just keep an eye on your, um, your houses. And if you see any like little fruit flies or tiny little wasps lingering around the entrance, just squish them. That's the other thing I would recommend. It's a lot of work, but <laughs> yeah. Does that answer your question? I good. <sighs> okay. Um, is it concerning to see dead bees in the garden? I can't say what kind of bees, likely honeybees or other smaller bees. Um, by the way, there are commercial honeybee hives on our block. And then on a happier note, I'm amazed to see bumblebees diving deep into flowers and coming out dusted with pollen. <laughs> um, okay, so is it concerning to see dead bees in the garden? So I would say it depends. Um, if you see a large congregation of dead bees in a certain area, like say underneath a tree or something, and there's like a whole bunch of different dead bees there, um, I would look up and, and check out that tree and, and think about um, whether it could have been sprayed by pesticides or not, or treated with some sort of pesticide. Um, but then again, if you see dead bees just um, like more like one off around the garden, that's pretty typical. Um, bees can die for a lot of different reasons. Um, they may have been born with a defect or it might just be the end of their life cycle. Most bees typically have just a one year life cycle. So it might also just have been their time um, to pass on. So yeah, I would say just look at, look, keep, take a, a close look as if there's a, a grouping of them. And if there is, then you'd want to be concerned. Okay. Uh, is it possible to relocate a bee's nest? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. So I've specifically heard of this for um, bumblebee colonies. This is actually something that um, in my other role at the Native Bee Society that we're trying to start doing. Um, and also you can move honeybee colonies as well. Um, and that, so if you, if you find a honeybee colony nesting in a place that you don't want it to, um, if that's the case, I would contact the Richmond Beekeepers Association. If you find a bumblebee colony nesting in a place you don't want to, you can contact the Native Bee Society of British Columbia. Um, and yeah, if you just Google, the, the website for Native Bee Society is just bcnativebees.org if you want to find that out. Um, there's a question, I think it's about, oh yeah, uh, have you noticed, heard of giant Asian hornets threatening local bee pop populations? Um, so Asian, I would say giant Asian hornets are mostly a threat to honeybees. Um, and there have been a few records of them being established in um, British Columbia this year. Um, and I think on Vancouver Island as well. Um, but yeah, the word is out on whether it, they affect native bee colonies. I kind of doubt it because um, Asian hornets have been adapted to predate on honeybees uh, from their, their native range. So they're attracted to larger colonies of bees. And it would probably take a lot of effort on the hornet's part to locate out different solitary bee nests. Um, so I don't think they're, they're as affected, wild bees are as affected by them. Um, yeah. Uh, how far away can a bee fly from its nest without getting lost? <laughs> Thanks, TJ. Um, so this depends on the bee. And a general rule of thumb is that the bigger the bee, the farther it can fly. Um, so smaller bees, like even, um, yeah, the smaller like mining bees or um, even the, uh, the hairy belly bees, they, they typically only fly around 
two to 300 meters from the place that they were born. So it's a very localized um, bee. And, uh, but with honeybees actually, they can fly several kilometers away. Um, and also bumblebees, the biggest bees around here can fly like even up, I've read up to 10 kilometers away and come back to its home. Mm -hmm. I think that's the last question. There's some thanks and comments. Uh, let's see, Honeybee Center in Surrey also comes with a big vacuum and relocates honeybee swarms. That's good to know. Mm -hmm. uh, Mo and Shad here added about the giant Asian hornet that there's been multiple instances of entries from ports and the border, only a matter of warmer winters until they are able to su survive here, even just a queen overwintering. Um, oh, Deanna just asked, how old is the Native Bee Society of BC? We are, we're babies. We just actually established in July of 2019. So this is our first, yeah, we're in our first year. We just celebrated our first birthday, actually. Um, yeah, it's been an interesting first year trying to start up a nonprofit in, during a pandemic. Um, but yeah, you can check us out on our website if you're interested. Um, yeah. Amazing. Yeah, we're at 827, so that's perfect if there are... Oh, okay. Well, why did you start the society? This will, I think this will be the last one. Okay. Um, <laughs> why did we start the society? Oh, great question. So we started the Native Bee Society because we felt that, first of all, um, in Vancouver and also in, in many other places in BC, there's a lot of really um, committed and passionate people that are interested in conserving native bees. Um, so the society was intended to be an organization to really bring those people together and build connections and, and amplify and build off of each other's um, innovation and creativity. And also, of course, we wanted to establish an organization that focused on, like there's a lot of different organizations that focus on honeybee, honeybees, um, but we, there's no... Um, there were no nonprofits in BC focused on the conservation of native bees. So those would be the two different reasons I would say we started the society. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Marika. This has been like such a great talk. Um, and yeah, I've learned, I've learned a whole bunch. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just like, it's such a beautiful presentation also. Your, oh, your PowerPoint was amazing. Um, yeah, so yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Um, for everyone, I will send out a link to the, the recording. Um, might be like a week or so. Um, and uh, yeah, so you'll, you'll have, uh, I'll, I'll pop my email here too, in case you have any questions about us. Um, I don't know if you wanna do that as well, Marika. Or yeah, I also there. just posted the EYA website um, and my, Oh, hi, Shanta. Hey, TJ. Um, here's my email with UIA. If you ever have any questions, I always love to try and um, help with these things as much as I can. So, <laughs> yay. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you again, everyone, for coming out. Um, yeah. Great. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Alan. <laughs> um, okay. Just going to save the chat. Great. <laughs> okay, I'm going to close this now. Thank okay. you again. Have a good night. Bye. Bye, everybody.